This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for September 11th through the 17th. On this week's show, we discuss the effects the September 11 terrorist attacks had on music, we talk about the first MTV Video Music Awards, and we celebrate a date that had a lot happen on it. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. This first story comes with a disclaimer. This is a music history podcast where we go deeper into events that briefly get touched upon on my daily Music History Today podcast found here every day, including weekends. Please like, subscribe, etc., etc. This first event, though, did have some effects on music, and we will mention those effects in detail. However, we are going to spend more than the average amount of time that we would normally spend on the event itself and also for that week, because the events of that week warrant it. We will, for one sentence only, say something about politics. Otherwise, we will not delve into the political ramifications of it, but mainly the musical ones. We will briefly debunk a major conspiracy theory surrounding it, and as you will find out later, this event is also very personal, and it also involves death and a lot of it. Some of you may be triggered over it, so there's your disclaimer right now and your warning. I know that I still get triggered whenever I go into a tall building or watch footage on television. Therefore, listener and viewer discretion is advised. One thing about the viewer discretion part, though. I should mention for the video watchers that the photos that you are seeing on the video during this segment are my photos, while the videos are actually stock footage. However, we will not, I repeat, not show any of the actual events or their immediate aftermath. Now, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's begin. On September 7, 2001, Michael Jackson held the first of his two 30th anniversary star-studded tribute concerts at Madison Square Garden in New York City. That same day, singer Ryan Adams recorded a music video for his song, New York, New York. In the music video, Ryan stood on the Brooklyn side of the East River at the Brooklyn Bridge Park, with the skyline of Lower Manhattan behind him. Among the buildings of the skyline were the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. On September 10, 2001, while testifying in front of Congress concerning $3.2 trillion in missing defense money, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld called the Pentagon bureaucracy the biggest threat to America. Rumsfeld was in the middle of his seventh month as Defense Secretary in the new George W. Bush Presidential Administration. On the evening of September 10, 2001, Michael Jackson performed the second of those tribute concerts at the Garden. Meanwhile, on September 10, yours truly, who has lived in New York City since 1996, went to the Borders Books and Music at the World Trade Center after work to buy something. The World Trade Center complex, much as it does today, had a mall. And I guarantee you, that absolutely none of us, myself and everybody else I just mentioned, figured that our next day would be so life-changing. It occurred to me the other day that there is now a complete generation that has graduated high school, college, and has been in the workforce for at least three years out of college who were not even born when the events of September 11th happened and have about as much attachment to the events that took place that week as most of Gen X have to, say, November 22, 1963, and President John F. Kennedy Jr.'s assassination. In fact, unless you were born before 1990, you probably vaguely remember watching what happened in the school classroom. 
Also, in order to understand the reaction, you have to remember the times. Therefore, a quick history lesson on the events of the day and also that particular week because while the events of September 11th have been covered in numerous documentaries, the aftermath tends to not be covered, especially one event that put the fear of God into everybody in New York City and Washington, D.C. that week. The morning of Tuesday, December 11th, started out as a pretty relatively warm, sunny day in New York City and Washington, D.C. Basketball icon Michael Jordan announced that morning via fax to the media that he was coming out of retirement to play for the Washington Wizards basketball team. What's a fax? Well, it's a, you know what, just Google it, kids, and get off my lawn while you're at it. Meanwhile, In New York City, it was election primary day for the local city elections, including one for mayor. Due to term limits, then-mayor Rudy Giuliani could not run again. In retrospect, probably a good thing. Musically, there were new releases for albums that day from Jay-Z, Mariah Carey, and Bob Dylan. Singer, actor, and writer Seth MacFarlane of Family Guy fame and rapper-turned-actor Marky Mark Wahlberg were both scheduled to be on early morning flights out of Boston, Massachusetts, both of them going to Los Angeles that morning. Both of them missed those flights, one due to a changed meeting and one apparently due to a hangover. Those flights, both Boeing 767s leaving Boston Logan International Airport, were the two planes that went into the World Trade Center. The first, American Airlines Flight 11, left Boston at 7.49 a.m. and hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center at 8.46 a.m., taking out the 93rd to 99th floors. Then, United Airlines Flight 175 left Boston at 8.14 a.m. and hit the South Tower of the World Trade Center at 9.03 a.m., taking out the 77 through the 85th floors. American Airlines Flight 77 was a Boeing 757 that left Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. at 8.20 a.m. on its way to Los Angeles. Instead, It ended up hitting the west wall of the Pentagon building in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., across the river, actually, on Potomac, at 9.37 a.m. United Airlines Flight 93 was a Boeing 757 that left Newark International Airport in Newark, New Jersey, at 8.42 a.m. on its way to San Francisco. According to interviews conducted with two men who organized the attacks, that plane was on its way to attack the United States Capitol building. By the time that plane was on its way to the Capitol, the passengers had received phone calls from their families as the other planes had hit their targets. Passengers rushed the cockpit where the hijackers were to try and get control of the plane back. The plane went down in a field in Stony Creek Township near Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 10.03 a.m., killing all on board. Four minutes before Flight 93 crashed into the field at 9.59 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center had massive structural failure from the superheated jet fuel and did a pancake implosion with one floor coming down on top of each other each one sounding like bombs going off from the impact of tons of concrete slamming down onto each other, not because the government set off bombs to implode the whole entire structure so that the government could start a war with Afghanistan and Iran, you conspiratorial idiots. (sighs) That debunks that myth. Anyway, moving on. At 10.28 a.m., the North Tower did the exact same thing, only it tilted over a little bit more, because debris from that collapse struck and destroyed the attached Marriott Hotel, along with the nearby 47-story 7 World Trade Center building. That building burned for another seven hours before collapsing itself at 5.21 p.m., not from a pancake implosion. 
Both the Marriott and Seven World Trade Center tend to be forgotten about during the telling of 9-11. You usually only hear about the North and South Towers, and that's it. By the time the morning had ended, four airplanes were hijacked and crashed into New York City, Washington, D.C., and in Pennsylvania. 2,977 people lost their lives. Among those people who were killed that day was jazz singer Betty Farmer, who was in one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Planes were grounded at 9.42 a.m. once the Federal Aviation Administration, a.k.a. the FAA, realized what was really going on. Subway service was completely shut down in New York City until about 2.30 in the afternoon that day. Meanwhile, bridges and tunnels coming in and out of Manhattan were completely closed down. The island was essentially cut off. Musically on that day, aside from the albums that came out, MTV and VH1 stopped playing music videos and instead played news reports from CBS News. Radio stations stopped playing music for the first time in decades and simulcasted newscasts. The Latin Grammy Awards, which were scheduled, were, of course, canceled. Sting, who was beginning an internet live stream when the attack started, only played one song, his song Fragile, and then he cut the stream. Paul McCartney, who was coincidentally flying out of New York that day from JFK Airport for London, England, sat on the tarmac of JFK watching the World Trade Center burning as his and all plane traffic was grounded for a few days. And actually, when you're on the tarmac of JFK, you have a clear view of downtown New York from there, off in the distance. Later that same afternoon, members of Congress went on to the United States Capitol building steps and sang God Bless America in a show of defiance to the terrorists. After the events of that day, a new century would be marked in the human consciousness, at least by before 9-11 and after 9-11. There was another event the very next week that has seemed to have been lost in the annals of history that led to even more heightened fears among people, especially in New York City and Washington, D.C. On September 18th, the anthrax terrorist attacks started as letters were mailed containing the deadly chemical to various news organizations in New York City and Washington, D.C., along with congressmen and various celebrities. 22 people came in contact with anthrax. Five died as a result, including postal employees who handled the packages and the letters. The attacks made people extremely afraid to touch their own mail. People thought that America was under attack again, leading to even more fear and nervousness. For years, the person who the FBI said was the prime suspect was bioweapons specialist Stephen Hatfill. However, after finally being exonerated in 2005, the FBI turned their attention to scientist and new chief suspect, Bruce Edwards Ivins. Ivins committed suicide in 2007. The FBI named Ivins as the main suspect in 2008 and closed the case officially in 2010. All of these attacks added to the mounting paranoia in the country in the fall of 2001. In fact, things got so crazy that the group Anthrax had to put out a statement saying that they weren't going to change their name, even though people really, really wanted them to. Now that you've got the lay of the land for that whole period, where does music fit into all of this? Well, aside from the Ryan Adams, Mark Wahlberg, and Michael Jackson references, plenty. For starters, the events of that day literally changed some albums. Dream Theater changed the cover art to their new album, as did the group Bush. Sheryl Crow decided not to release a song about having a lack of heroes. Dave Matthews changed their next single release from When the World Ends to Every Day, which actually became a big hit. The Strokes removed the anti-police brutality song, New York City Cops, from the CD release of their album, Is This It? 
which also had been released on September 11, 2001. A lot of songs were written about that day, from the Beastie Boys with an open letter to New York City, to Beyonce with I Was There, to Mary Chapin Carpenter with Grand Central Station, to two songs from Sheryl Crow on her album Detours. Bruce Springsteen put out an entire album about it called The Rising. Gerard Way watched the Twin Towers come down as he was riding across New York Harbor on the ferry. The experience of the fragility of life led to him following his dreams and starting his band, My Chemical Romance. On the censorship front, Clear Channel Radio Station Company had a lot of songs that were, quote, of questionable taste, unquote, that they stopped playing, or at least highly suggested that their station stop playing. Clear Channel is now iHeartRadio, just for the record. On that list were songs like Billy Joel's Only the Good Die Young, Dave Matthews Band's Crash Into Me, and every single song that Rage Against the Machine had ever put out up until that point, which the band saw as a badge of honor. Above all, music helped to heal the nation. Aside from the usual patriotic music, there were tribute concerts that were played, most notably the concert for New York, which was held not too long after the attacks at the Madison Square Garden, which had David Bowie the Who, among many others. After years of arguments between officials, realty people, and surviving family members, the World Trade Center site was revitalized with new buildings and a memorial museum and park. I have been to the museum only once and broke down in the middle of it. Also, if you go to the Memorial Park, please be considerate and realize that it's not really a place for you to take smiling selfies. It's a cemetery, as hundreds of remains still have not been found to this very day. And it is very disrespectful as a certain presidential candidate posing with a smile and a thumbs up at Arlington National Cemetery next to soldiers' graves. That was the one political statement that I made. And that's about as political as I'm going to get here. No talk about the ramifications from 9-11, like the Patriot Surveillance Act, the added scrutiny that Arab people had to feel, or the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That is all for somebody else's podcast, not for this one. So, why is this so personal, aside from the fact that I was in New York that day? Well, here are my memories from that first week. When I first moved to New York in the mid-1990s, I worked for a very short time at a record store at the World Trade Center. Then I went into finance. One day in 2000, I had an interview for a finance job. That same time was a crossroads time for me as I had also interviewed for an entertainment job and I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to stay in finance and go back to music and entertainment, which is what I loved. I was actually accepted for both jobs, so I had a choice to make. Do I go with a job that would make me a ton of money that I sort of liked but really did not want to do for the rest of my life? Or do I take a job that I loved but didn't make as much money? I chose the job that I loved and still have, even though it paid less than the finance job. Good call, as it turned out. You see... That finance job was on one of the upper floors of the World Trade Center where no one escaped from. Everybody on that section died. On 9-11, I took the 7 train home to Flushing, Queens, where I lived at the time. As the train turned the corner in Astoria, Queens, to go to Flushing, I turned and stared at the smoke coming from Lower Manhattan. I remember walking in Manhattan during that first week in a state of utter disbelief and shock like everybody else. I have only felt that kind of silence in New York City two other times while living here these past few decades. The days when everything shut down during the COVID lockdowns in 2020. And the day after the Boston Red Sox came back and beat the New York Yankees during the 2004 playoffs. Go Red Sox! 
sorry, I'm from Massachusetts. I'm a Sox fan. It's just kind of the way it is. And that day felt great. I'm not going to lie. Anyway, back to this. I remember Army vehicles blocking traffic going anywhere lower than 14th Street as you couldn't go into lower Manhattan unless you lived there and you had identification. I remember that smell coming from Ground Zero. It smelled like a combination of rotten eggs and everything else that was pungent and you can't even really describe it. I will just never forget that smell for as long as I live. I remember the families of the missing lined up on 23rd Street near the Armory Building as that was a place to find out about missing loved ones. They eventually found out that only 18 people survived all of the building collapses. I also remember the camera crews with reporters asking stupid questions to the relatives like, how do you feel right now? Like, really? How do you think they felt? Anyway, parading people's griefs around for their ratings. Stupid vultures. I've often looked back at that day as sort of a rebirth day in my life, so this day tends to be a pretty somber one for me, even after all these years and, well, now decades later. One little choice to pursue what I loved in reality, saved my life. Who knows if I would have kept the finance job long enough to be in that building that day, but knowing me, I probably would have. I mean, I've kept this particular job that I got rid of the other job for, for now 25 years. This isn't about me, though, although I sort of am connected, but... This is about the 2,977 souls that were lost that day. May they forever rest in peace, hopefully. What I do know is that my life, along with the lives of a lot of people in the music industry and beyond, drastically changed in the days since the events that happened on September 11th, 2001 and beyond. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. All right. Well, that was depressing as hell. Actually, it took me about eight tries to get through that whole thing. Let's pep this up a little bit, shall we? On August 1st, 1981, a TV channel that would forever change music and television began. It was called MTV. Even though MTV spent the first four years building its reputation as a pop culture influencer, by the time 1984 rolled around, it had definitely earned its place in the pop culture zeitgeist as the cultural phenomenon that it became, influencing everything from music to fashion to television shows like Miami Vice. We'll get to that one later. So, what's a cultural phenomenon like MTV to do? Why, Pat? itself on the back, of course, with its own award show. Who wouldn't? MTV came up with the MTV Video Music Awards. To be eligible, your video had to have been played between May 2nd, 1983 to May 2nd, 1984. 1,500 music industry professionals decided the vast majority of the awards, with the Viewer's Choice Awards being decided by a fan vote. The award that was given to the winners was a statue of a moon man, a nod to a, the opening montage at the beginning of every hour of its programming. The network got veteran sports television producer Don Olmeyer to produce the show, along with MTV Channel CEO Bob Pittman 
and producer Ed Griles, who directed the show as well. Cindy Lauper was the most nominated artist that night with nine nominations, six for Girls Just Want to Have Fun and three for Time After Time. Jazz artist Herbie Hancock's music video for his song Rocket, which combined hip hop and jazz, along with the iconic music video for the police's song Every Breath You Take, each received eight nominations. ZZ Top had six nominations from three different videos, Sharp Dress Man, Legs, and Give Me All Your Lovin'. Michael Jackson had six nominations for Thriller, and The Cars had six nominations for You Might Think. Billy Idol had five nominations for Dancing With Myself and Eyes Without a Face. David Bowie had four nominations for China Girl and Modern Love. And if you're wondering why Let's Dance wasn't thrown in there, it did not hit the eligibility mark at that point. The video of the year nominees for 1984 were Herbie Hancock's Rocket, Michael Jackson's Thriller, Cyndi Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun, The Police's Every Breath You Take, and The Cars's You Might Think. Who won video of the year? Well, we'll tell you in a few minutes. I will tell you right now, though, that Herbie Hancock was the big winner of the night as Rocket won five awards, while Michael Jackson won three for Thriller. On September 14th, 1984, the first MTV Video Music Awards ceremony was held. The ceremony was held at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Mayor Ed Koch, who was the first presenter that night, proclaimed Radio City Music Hall to be renamed Video City Music Hall for just that one night, mind you. Then he introduced hosts Dan Aykroyd and Bette Midler, who spent their monologue trying to act cool by telling risque jokes, because that's what you do. There were a bunch of performances that night. Rod Stewart started it off with Infactuation. There were also performances by Huey Lewis and the News performing I Want a New Drug, David Bowie doing a pre tape performance of Blue Jean from London, Tina Turner doing What's Love Got to Do With It, ZZ Top performing Sharp Dress Man, and Ray Parker Jr. performing Ghostbusters, which was one of the big summer movies that year. However, there was one performance that ruled them all, both in terms of turning this artist into a superstar and, of course, in terms of shock value, at least at that time. And it was all done kind of accidentally. Madonna was the second performance of the night. She was scheduled to do the title track from her brand new album, Like a Virgin, and was not quite a superstar yet. Madonna popped out of a 17-foot-tall wedding cake in a see-through wedding dress with her now-famous boy toy belt and bustier and started performing. As she started, she suffered her first wardrobe malfunction as her shoe came off when she was climbing down the stairs off of that cake. At that point, rather than run after the shoe... She quickly decided to kind of make it look like it was part of the act. So she started twisting around on stage seductively, trying to get the shoe. As she did that, she accidentally also created wardrobe malfunction number two by flashing her underwear at the TV audience. As she said in an interview in 2014, quote, So I thought, well, I'll just pretend I meant to do this. And I dove onto the floor and I rolled around. And as I reached for the shoe, the dress went up and the underpants were showing. End quote. The audience was stone quiet, not sure what to make of it, even in a rock and roll crowd. The conservatives in the country were up in arms. They'd get used to that feeling when it came to Madonna. Kids like me fell in love with her. And Madonna Mania was officially born that night. All five of the MTV video jocks, known as the VJs, made appearances during the show sporadically. The late great J.J. Jackson appeared in a backstage segment before a commercial break. Alan Hunter appeared in a segment from the mezzanine after a commercial break. 
John Cougar Mellencamp, now of course known as John Mellencamp, was interviewed by Mark Goodman from his seat before they went to commercial. David Lee Roth was interviewed by Martha Quinn from his seat before a commercial break, and Carly Simon was interviewed by Nina Blackwood backstage just before they went to commercial. As far as the awards themselves went, here's who presented, and here's who won each award. Cindy Lauper read the eligibility and the voting rules first in some sort of weird made-up language. Roger Daltrey of The Who smashed the guitar on stage, which was usually bandmate Heat Townsend's gimmick, while presenting the award for Best Overall Performance in a Video, which went to Michael Jackson for Thriller. Diana Ross accepted all of Michael's awards that night on his behalf, as Michael was nowhere to be found that night. Grace Slick and Mickey Thomas of Jefferson Starship, at that point simply known as Starship, presented Best New Artist in a Video, which went to Eurythmics for Sweet Dreams Are Made of This. Ronnie Wood at the Rolling Stones presented Best Stage Performance in a Video, which went to Van Halen for Jump. Daryl Hall and John Oates, back when they were talking to each other, introduced the winners of the professional categories, as they like to say. In those categories, Godly and Cream won Best Special Effects and Best Editing and shared Best Art Direction with Jim Whiting, all of them for Herbie Hancock's video, Rocket. For Best Cinematography, that went to Daniel Pearl for The Police's Every Breath You Take. Peter Wolf of the Jay Giles Band and of solo fame presented Best Choreography in a Video with ballerina Cynthia Gregory. That one went to Michael Jackson and Michael Peters for the, of course, Thriller Dance in Thriller. Dale Basio of Missing Persons presented the Most Experimental Video. Herbie Hancock's Rocket won that one. Rick Ocasek of The Cars presented Best Group Video. That was won by ZZ Top for Legs. Mick Jagger introduced the Video Vanguard Award, and then he introduced the presenters of the award, which were The Police, via pre-recorded video message. Sting was not around in order to do it. It was actually Andy Summers and Stuart Copeland who then presented Video Vanguard to The Beatles and film director Richard Lester, who had directed The Beatles films A Hard Day's Night and Help. Herbie Hancock presented Video Vanguard to David Bowie. Iggy Pop accepted Bowie's awards on his behalf. Film director John Landis, who directed Michael Jackson's Thriller video, presented Best Direction in a Video, which went to director Tim Newman for ZZ Top's Sharp Dressed Man. Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood, who used to be in the group The Faces together, presented the Special Recognition Award to Quincy Jones. Fee Wabel, lead singer of The Tubes, presented Best Concept Video, which went to Herbie Hancock's Rocket. Billy Idol presented Video's Choice Award, which went to Michael Jackson's Thriller. Simon LeBon and Nick Rhodes of Duran Duran presented Best Female Video. That went to Cindy Lauper for Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Belinda Carlisle and Kathy Valentine of The Go-Go's presented Best Male Video. David Bowie won for China Girl on that. Like I said earlier, Iggy Pop popped up on stage in order to grab that award for David. And then... Eddie Murphy and Joe Piscopo, the dynamic duo of Saturday Night Live that year, presented Video of the Year. You might think that Thriller won it. You would be wrong. With their only award win of the evening, the Cars' music video for You Might Think took home the top prize, making it one of the only times that a Video of the Year winner did not win another award for that ceremony. The very first MTV Video Music Awards, along with the history and superstar making performance, accidentally, of Madonna's on September 14th, 1984. Normally, I would use this spot to celebrate a birthday or two. Instead, I'm going to celebrate a date. 
September 13th. The 13th had a lot of very important things happen to it. Let's start off, for instance, in the world of hip-hop. On the night of September 7th, 1996, Quincy Jones and actress Peggy Lipton's daughter, Kideda Jones, waited for rapper Tupac Shakur in a Las Vegas hotel room. Kideda was Tupac's fiancé at the time. Tupac and his record label owner, Suge Knight, were at the Mike Tyson heavyweight boxing match. After the match, as they walked through the MGM Grand Hotel, someone in their entourage spotted a member of the Crips Street Gang. A fight broke out in the hotel. Pac and Knight left the hotel and drove off and headed towards the Club 662, which was owned by Suge. They were stopped by the cops for not having driver's licenses on the car which Suge was driving. They were later let go without a ticket as the plates were actually in the trunk of the car. After a minute or two, they stopped at a stoplight at the corner of East Flamingo Road and Covell Lane. As they waited for the light to turn green, a white Cadillac pulled up next to them. Shots were fired from the Cadillac, hitting Tupac in the chest, leg, and arm. Suge was hit by shrapnel. Tupac was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead on September 13, 1996, from his gunshot wounds. His alleged killer was finally arrested nearly 30 years later as they arrested former gang member Dwayne Keith Davis for Tupac's murder in 2023. Precisely two years earlier, in 1994, Tupac's rival at the time, Notorious B.I.G., released his album, Ready to Die, considered one of the greatest hip-hop albums ever made. In 1988, Eazy-E released his album, Easy Does It. Also on September 13, 1980, a really cheesy hour-long show called Solid Gold debuted. The show was a countdown show that had performances. The show had different hosts over the years, including Arsenio Hall, Dionne Warwick, Marilyn McCoo, Andy Gibb, radio DJ Rick Dees, Rex Smith, Waylon Flowers of Waylon and Madam, Jeff Altman, Lucinda Dickey, and MTV VJ Nina Blackwood. The show was mainly known for a group of people known as the Solid Gold Dancers. Every song, they would dance around in spandex. Gold, of course. It was the 80s in all its glorious cheesiness. Google the videos and enjoy them, kids. They're on YouTube. The show ran for eight years and won a Primetime Emmy Award. Okay, it was for outstanding lighting design, but still, a Primetime Emmy Award winning show. With those fabulous solid gold dancers. In the 1960s, a couple of rock traditions happened on September 13th. For instance, in 1965, the Beatles released what would become the most played, or overplayed, if you will, song on the radio. That song was Yesterday. In 1969, the Plastic Ono Band debuted on stage at a music festival in Toronto, Canada. However, the tradition that came out of it was when the festival host, Kim Fowley, asked the audience to hold up and light their cigarette lighters. And that is where that trend, now of course replaced by cell phone light, began. In 1814, the Battle of Fort McHenry took place. Back to a little actual history for you. It would inspire a witness to the attack, Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner, which would become known as the American National Anthem. In less patriotic news in 2009, Kanye West interrupted Taylor Swift's acceptance speech that night at the MTV Video Music Awards, starting that whole downward spiral. So, here's to you, September 13th, and to all future September 13ths. You got some tough acts to follow. Good luck with that. There is one other event that happened that had a huge effect on pop culture in the 1980s, but it did not happen on September 13th. However, we need to talk about it because it was also one of my absolute favorite TV shows from the 80s. 
on Sunday night, September 16th, 1984, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, NBC ran the two-hour pilot for a TV cop show. The popular myth is that NBC programming head Brandon Tartikoff wrote the words MTV Cops onto a napkin during a brainstorming session for new TV shows. He presented the idea to writer Anthony Yurkovich, who wrote and produced the TV show Hill Street Blues, and producer Michael Mann. Yurkovich wrote the pilot episode and called the show Gold Coast, but then he changed it to what it became known as Miami Vice. Yurkovich was obsessed with Miami. The city at the time was experiencing a lot of violent crime and wealth as it had become the cocaine capital of America in the 1980s. The show also caught hell for its use of violence in every episode. However, it was depicting the Miami cocaine wars. That war was not exactly known as a nonviolent kind of thing. Yurkovich focused the show on the Miami Vice Squad and the frustration that they felt taking down drug dealers and cartel members only to have more pop up and take their places. The show cast Don Johnson as Detective Sonny Crockett and Philip Michael Thomas as Ricardo Tubbs. The show borrowed its look from Miami's South Beach area with its pastel color schemes at that time. The show, however, was not an immediate hit. It was more of a slow burn. It started out okay, but not great in 1984. And somehow in the spring of 1985, it suddenly caught fire. And by the time its second season premiered in September of 1985, it was a cultural phenomenon, much like MTV was. There were many parts of it that helped make it define the 80s. The first was its use of colors. Neon pink and blue might have been a thing before Vice, but it was maybe an occasional music video that did it. After Vice, though, pastels and neon colors were everywhere. The show expertly created a style all its own. It became fashionable to have three-day-old stubble, wear suits with white t-shirts and shoes with no socks, basically the Italian Armani look. It made drug dealers look very glamorous with nice boats, mansions, and especially cars. Ferrari, of course, being the big ones. Testarossa, to be exact. It also started the current tourism and party town boom of the past 20 years or so in Miami, which is kind of strange when you consider that they were portraying the city as an extremely violent place, but people wanted to go see what was going on. Go figure. Miami Vice was affected by and helped to affect music. The show spent over $10,000 per episode just on buying music rights to songs to play on the show. From the pilot episode with the now iconic nighttime drive scene to get the bad guy Calderon, while Phil Collins' hit song In the Air Tonight played in the background, the show incorporated that MTV video montage feel. In fact, In the Air Tonight is now synonymous with the show, not so much with Phil Collins anymore. Phil Collins showed up on the show, actually, playing a con man called Phil the Shill for an episode. Other musicians acted on the show as well, like Miles Davis, Sheena Easton, Little Richard, James Brown, Gloria Estefan, which you would figure because she lived in Miami and, of course, was part of Miami Sound Machine, Gene Simmons, Willie Nelson, Frank Zappa, and Glenn Fry, whose song Smuggler's Blues became an entire episode. Musician and composer Jan Hammer's soundtrack helped to anchor the show, and people loved the music so much that the show put out two soundtrack albums. The first one spent 11 weeks at number one on the Billboard Albums chart in 1985, while Jan Hammer's theme song hit number one on the singles chart. That soundtrack album, by the way, became the biggest selling TV soundtrack album of all time. Along with musicians acting, the show attracted heavyweight actors like Pam Greer, Brian Dennehy, and Eartha Kitt. The laundry list of actors on the show who were unknown at the time is long. 
Everyone from Bruce Willis, Chris Rock, Ben Stiller, Liam Neeson, Stanley Tucci, Jimmy Smith, who played Crockett's first partner for maybe the first 15 minutes of the pilot episode before he got blown up in a car bombing. Wesley Snipes, Lou Diamond Phillips, Ed O'Neill, Julia Roberts, and the list goes on and on as actors who got their starts on Miami Vice. Miami Vice set a trend. The network didn't have much faith in the show because they put it on one of the worst time slots in television at the time, which was always Friday nights at 10 p.m. when everybody was going out for the night. What happened was that people started delaying going out until 11 o'clock so that they could stay home and watch the show. Because remember, unless you had a VCR, and not many people did back then, then you either had to stay home and watch the show or you were going to miss it. That was it. Unless you caught summer reruns. And honestly, who was going to be around at 10 o'clock on a Friday night in the summertime? Not many people. Once the show got hot, though, everybody started copying the styles. Copycat TV shows started to show up, but failed miserably because they didn't get the concept that Miami Vice was going for. These copycat shows all figured that all you had to do was just play some popular music in the background during the scenes or maybe do some video music montage edits and you would have a Miami Vice style show. Vice was so much more than just good editing. It was great acting with a style all its own, and it couldn't be copied. When you think about the look and feel of the 80s, if you're not thinking about Michael Jackson's thriller jacket or maybe a members-only jacket, remember those? Big hair, band hair, big hair, band hair, or even big shoulder pads, then you're probably going to be thinking about pink and blue neon guys in Armani suits with t-shirts and also with Ray-Ban glasses and, of course, three-day-old stubble. So even without knowing it, you're thinking about the style that was put forth by Miami Vice. It defined the style of the mid to late 1980s. The pilot episode of Miami Vice... 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on NBC on September 16th, 1984. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for September 11th through the 17th. Thanks for listening and watching.